There we are. Uh, Russ, thank you very much. And so uh, we have a very busy uh, schedule today. And so what's going to happen is uh, I'm going to have a, a relatively short uh, talk after which Russ and I will have some banter afterwards and we'll discuss uh, people's questions. Feel free to write them in the chat box if you wish. And then we're more than happy to go over what we're able to go over in the time allotted. So I thought I would talk about some of the archeological and digs and the tourmaline uh, mining uh, related to San Diego. And if you folks aren't familiar with this, you're probably wondering what tourmaline has to do with anything. So uh, Mutink, we have the next slide. So tourmaline is a semi-precious stone and you can go to a jeweler's and buy a ring with a tourmaline stone anytime. Uh, it comes in a variety of colors and the reason for the colors uh, are, uh, are are the uh, 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 imperfections and the uh, various elements that are present in this in the uh, silicate, uh, such as iron, titanium, lithium. Each one creates a different type of color, and it can be uh, quite beautiful. And uh, next slide, please. So we're going to talk about uh, Dowager Empress Su Chi and why her. Well. She liked tourmaline and we'll talk about it. Also called Empress Dowager Su Chi and she lived a, a goodly long life and she reigned as the Dowager Empress for quite some time until she died in 1908. And then shortly thereafter, the Qing Dynasty ended and the Republic started. And I thought I would mention what a Dowager is. Uh, you may say, well, what's a Dowager Empress? Uh, it's a term for a woman and a woman has to be a widow and uh, the woman inherits property or a title from her late husband, particularly if the late husband was a dignitary or king. So it's actually sort of a sexist term, isn't it? Because you're defining a woman via her late husband. So it's sort of like Mrs. John Smith on a letter. So, but nevertheless, that's what uh, Su Chi was called. And I threw in Diane here because when you see uh, old articles about famous women, you often will see uh, one title or another. They both start with a D. Uh, a doyen is a woman very respected in her field. So for example, Lily Cheng would be a doyen. And so, um, and I guess you could be both at the same time, but uh, just for clarification. So could we have the next slide, please? Here's a painting of uh, uh, Empress Dowager Su Qi, and uh, she brought China to the modern era. She was uh, a uh, tough person and she uh, was ruthless and she uh, had a very complicated legacy, good and bad, uh, but uh, she was well-respected and she loved tourmaline. And so since she loved tourmaline so much, number one, she owned over a ton of the gems personally. And number two, uh, people who uh, uh, were in her court, uh, the mandarins would wear round buttons made of tourmaline and this became a status symbol. So this is, just think of, uh, of when uh, a uh, British uh, princess uh, uh, whereas uh, Princess uh, Kate wears a, a certain dress and everyone buys it. So, or people can buy a, a plate that has a, a Queen Elizabeth on it. So here everyone would buy tourmaline. So it wasn't just uh, her. And it was felt to be mystical. And uh, uh, the pink variety uh, conferred balance and protection and the green was male balance. So pink was female balance. And so as you'd expect, Su, Su Chi loved pink. Uh, and so uh, guess where it was mined? Let's see the next slide. It was mined right here in San Diego. There was a huge tourmaline mine, which still exists uh, at the foot of Mount Palomar. And Chinese merchants uh, were uh, very vigorous in exporting uh, this tourmaline uh, to, uh, uh, to China. And Aquin Sun became a mining engineer, partly because of the tourmaline uh, industry. 
And uh, the owner of the mine became a guy named Jay Lipman Tannenbaum. And he was from Tiffany's from New York. And he came out to San Diego. And interestingly enough, uh, talking about inclusion and anti-hate and so forth, he hired an African-American way back over 100 years ago as his mining superintendent. So he was uh, remarkably uh, ahead of his time, which is, uh, I think, very cool thing. When the Dowager died in 1908, interest in tourmaline uh, in China faded dramatically. And I'm only laughing because Tannenbaum had, I think, a $300,000 uh, order for China that he was about to ship exactly when he heard that uh, she died. So what he did was he very quickly shipped it uh, so he could get paid for it. And it was uh, in transit uh, when uh, it arrived in China, only to find that there was no basic taker for it, but he got paid for it. So let's have the next slide. Um, this is actually a photo of miners at the Himalaya mine in San Isabel uh, by Mount Palomar. And uh, it's still owned, I think by permission, you can actually get uh, uh, a, uh, you can actually get a uh, tour of it. And at their height, uh, tons were mined and basically all shipped to China. And um, you can buy a snuff bottle, which she didn't own them all. As I mentioned, a lot of the hangers on would buy tourmaline uh, in her honor and to be uh, carrying favor in her court. Uh, and these are sale for, on sale from time to time. Uh, in auction houses, and uh, I, uh, I'm always on the lookout. I'm going to get one sooner or later. I'm figuring in the next year I should have one. And so uh, uh, let's take the next slide. And I've got some pictures of some beautiful snuff bottles. And uh, as you know, the snuff bottles are these little itty bitty things that were carried by upper class Chinese people, and they had. Uh, on the end of that cap was a little spoon and the snuff is powdered tobacco and the powdered tobacco you would put in your nose and you would sneeze. And this was felt to be an elegant and healthful thing to do. And uh, it was uh, one of the characteristics of the wealthy. Uh, so here you have a couple of them and they come in all different kinds of, uh, of shapes and patterns. And uh, you see the green uh, cap on the one on the right so uh, it's a very cool thing. And San Diego was basically a major part of uh, the tourmaline trade and uh, Su uh love of tourmaline. So if we could have the next slide. So what have we got here? We've got a mollusk called abalone. And abalone was basically never used uh, or eaten by uh, Americans until the Chinese came. So the Chinese arrived in the 1840s with the gold rush. When that petered out, they did a lot of uh, railroad building. I think as Russell might point out, they basically built them all in the West. And uh, then after that, they turned to all, to all sorts of different industries. And uh, fishing was a major one. And uh, since they were used to abalone, they, uh, uh, fished for it. And nowadays, modern era, abalone is an expensive, uh, rare mollusk, which is uh, prohibited in some areas from being fished because of its scarcity uh, and uh, is costly. But back in the day, uh, back in the day, it was actually remarkably uh, uh, common. And uh, shellfish were very, very common. And they were eaten by uh, everybody, uh, rich and poor. Uh, you know, like uh, uh, in Dublin's Fair City, uh, Sweet Molly, Malone, Cockles and Mussels. Uh, nowadays, we think of shellfish as, um, as more uh, uh, upper middle class. Um, if we could have the next slide. So what happened was the Chinese immigrants in the late 1800s revolutionized California cuisine. And California cuisine had been uh, more agrarian and cattle-based. And because of uh, uh, 
uh, because of Chinese fishing, which by the way, involved all sorts of stuff, but including abalone, um, uh, their taste changed. And uh, the meat uh, of abalone was air dried on racks. And when dried, it was packed in canvas bags and then it was transported. Some of it back to China, others throughout California. And it was uh, pounded until tender and cooked. And the um, uh, collapse of the abalone uh, fishing uh, occurred uh, twice. Uh, once uh, in 1990, more recently, when overfishing collapsed uh, the entire population. And there are no commercial abalone uh, uh, fisher, uh, 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 fisheries in California. Let's have the next slide, please. But back in the day, back in the day, uh, back in the day, uh, particularly around Point Loma, Ballast Point, you think of as a beer, as a craft beer, but it also is a place on Point Loma. And uh, it's now owned by the Navy, Ballast Point. And La Playa is not owned by the Navy. La Playa is a uh, lovely beach that has a yacht club on it. And, uh, and it was, uh, these were all sites of Chinese fisheries and, uh, and uh, boat docks. And how do we know this? Because archeological investigations have found all sorts of abalone shells uh, when people are digging to put up their uh, mansions on Point Loma. And you can go there now, there's a beautiful hiking trail uh, by La Playa. And uh, what do you see on the hiking trail? You see giant mansions and you see a yacht club, but you also see, if we could see the next slide, you also see a memorial to the Chinese fishermen. And so uh, the memorial to the Chinese fishermen is very lovely. It has a, a little carving of a, uh, of a large Chinese junk and it tells a little story. Uh, of the fishermen and so forth and so on. And what occurred was discrimination started to occur in the 1800s. And it was shocking, it was shocking. Uh, there was the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act that some of you may be aware of. And, um, and the Chinese uh, Exclusion Act was unique because it was uniquely directed against a single solitary group of people and prevented them largely from coming to the United States after 1882. There were just an array of discriminatory and excluding acts and tariffs on fishing, and the Geary Act, the Scott Act. In courts of law, uh, Chinese people were not allowed to testify. So this is basically uh, gave non-Chinese right to do what they wanted with Chinese people, knowing that in court, uh, Chinese couldn't, uh, testify. The La Playa uh, beach is just on the uh, proximal part of, uh, of Point Loma on the east coast uh, of Point Loma. So if you just drive uh, around from downtown San Diego, you're there in two minutes. Um, and it's easy to get to. And all this discrimination was just absolutely mindless and shocking as discrimination always is, in as much as immigrants are endlessly entrepreneurial, they're endlessly uh, business oriented, they're often excluded from large companies, so they themselves start their own small businesses and they're economic engines for any country that immigrants uh, enter. So, uh, so uh, exclusions are uh, never logical and are always emotionally and non-logically based, often taking jobs that the native people weren't interested in doing in the first place. So um, uh, if we can have the next slide. Now here we have a little map and right by our museum, our San Diego Chinese Historical Museum is at 3rd and J. And if you can see in the old days, uh, you know, there was uh, the marshland was not filled in and was not reclaimed and there were beaches there. And we think that the Chinese fishing villages and shacks were right there. And we uh, say that because uh, we, again, we find on digging, we find all sorts of artifacts, uh, uh, hooks and shells and this and that. 
interestingly, uh, the shell of the abalone, uh, if we could have uh, the uh, next slide, uh, the shell of the abalone is uh, quite beautiful in itself. And um, it was uh, carved for jewelry making and many of the very same fishermen when they were fishing for uh, for say barracuda or what have you, would fashion pieces of that shiny bright shell into lures and the lures would be put on the lines to help catch the fish. So they use the shells for all sorts of things. If you look at this beautiful diorama, which is at the Chinese Historical Museum and the picture on the right is also there. Uh, if you look to the very right of that picture, you see those three shacks and you see a table and then you see another table way on the right and on that table on the right are all sorts of things on the table. And what that is, is abalone drying. And so this is large amounts of abalone drying out so as to be uh, packed and shipped. And so it's just a beautiful diorama. Our museum has a bunch of lovely dioramas from a uh, hundred plus years ago. So this is all pre-1900 because by about 1900, what with the 1882 Exclusion Act, that alone, uh, all the fishermen aged out and there were no people to replace them. So it was, a, it was really a sad sight. And uh, if we could have the uh, next slide, please. Uh, I thought I would mention a little bit about Chinatown excavations. And when our talk is over, uh, I think we're going to have, Russ and I will, will chat, we'll have a little bit of banter about uh, the difference between a shard of pottery that one digs and finds up, find, finds, and a uh, bronze ding from a uh, 1000 BCE from the Shang Dynasty. Well, we can talk about which is better. And, uh, and as each of the old ramshackle wooden buildings was raised and replaced, a ton of artifacts, well, yeah, I use that uh, uh, hyperbolically, uh, a, a bunch of artifacts were unearthed. We found coins and beads and bottles and dice and all sorts of stuff, teapots and um, glass bottles, earthen bottles, uh, plates, uh, cups, and a lot of it was sent to the Chinese Historical Museum when the buildings were built, when, when Harbor Towers were built, uh, just a, a whole bunch of, uh, of artifacts were found. And we've got boxes of them, many on display. If we could have the uh, next slide, please. And so what you're looking at here is uh, you're looking at some of the stuff on display uh, at the uh, Chinese Historical Museum. And um, <clears throat> uh, much of the material dates from the 1880s. The glass bottles are pretty easy to date. And uh, uh, there was a machine that uh, was a glass bottle making machine that was about 1905. And uh, before that machine was invented, uh, there would be uh, a glass uh, uh, pouring uh, uh, in, uh, in a cast and then the top would be hand blown. And so when the seam goes up to the lip, you know that that's a bottle that is post 1905 when the seam stops at the uh, neck of the bottle and the top is hand blown without a seam, you know that's pre 1905. So it's not hard to date a lot of these bottles. And when the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, the CCBA developed their senior gardens, which opened in 1997, guess what? Uh, tons of stuff was found and displayed. If we could have the next slide. So lots of Protestant organizations, uh, particularly in the Northeast, Presbyterians and particularly the Congregationalists were very vigorous uh, proselytizers. And they, uh, the Congregationalists particularly went around the world. They uh, settled in the Middle East where they started the university American University of Beirut, the American University in Cairo. Uh, they uh, loved the Middle East. They attempted to convert the uh, Arabs uh, without much success, but they were much beloved personally. And uh, they, weirdly enough, the modern day Arabists in the State Department are, many of them are the great grandchildren of these uh, uh, original uh, missionaries. And uh, they all, many of them were born, they would be born in the Middle East and 
traveled back east to New England to go to high school and to college and then moved back to the Middle East. And they went around on ships uh, around the uh, around South America to California, and uh, you'll see uh, Congregationalist churches uh, throughout California from the old days. And if you go to Hawaii, you see more. And uh, we have a beautiful building designed by the nephew of the famed architect Irving Gill, Lewis Gill designed this. And it was dedicated in 1927 as the San Diego Mission Building, Congregationalist Mission Building. And it had both the sanctuary and a dormitory in it. And then it was uh, closed and unused and it was actually relocated a few blocks to its current site. And in 1996, with the help of lots of very generous benefactors, uh, was dedicated and the Chinese uh, Historical Museum appeared. And uh, we are hoping to reopen, by the way, our, our target date is around September 1st, and we love to see you folks and to show you uh, what we have. Now, I was seeing all these artifacts, so I thought to myself, why don't I start digging in my backyard and see what I can't find? So I was thinking, you know, uh, what might I find? So Mu Ting, if we got the first picture, so look, there I go, and I find some, uh, some terracotta warriors, and the middle one, oddly enough, by coincidence, looked a lot like me. And so I thought to myself, why don't I do a little bit more digging and see what else I can find? So here you go. So if you want to come to Escondido, you can check this out. Actually, you know, we, uh, Russell and I are going to talk about this. This is actually, as everybody knows, these are from Xi'an. China, and these are uh, 2,200 years old uh, funereal objects from the first emperor. Uh, anyway, I, I want to thank everybody for listening to this relatively short talk. 